be an even better planet for us than Earth? Scientists are searching for a super habitable world that wouldn't just rival Earth, but be a place where life could thrive even more easily. And they're looking at exoplanets. How would we discover Earth 2.0? What would make an exoplanet habitable? And how long would it take to get there? This is What If, and here's what would happen if we discovered Earth 2.0. You wouldn't be able to find an exoplanet by looking through a telescope. All you'd see is the bright glare of the stars they orbit. NASA built the Kepler telescope to discover exoplanets. And before it ran out of fuel, the Kepler telescope surveyed our region of the Milky Way galaxy. Its technology uses the transit method to find planets hundreds of light years away. How? It measured the fluctuation of light coming from distant stars. When a planet transits or passes in front of a star, the star isn't as bright, so the Kepler telescope uses that to detect exoplanets. This is not an easy thing to do, but during its nine-year lifetime, the Kepler telescope confirmed the existence of 4,367 exoplanets. Could any of them be Earth 2.0? Hey, just by virtue of the fact you're watching this, we know you love to learn, just like us. I really wanted to take my learning up a notch this year, so I figured I'd learn a new language. I've got a lot of German in my family, so I wanted to give German a shot. That's why I've been using the sponsor of today's video, Babbel, to help me out. It's not only a fun challenge, but it'll help me connect better with my family members. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world. It's scientifically proven to help you start speaking a language in just three weeks. And it's not all about theory. They use lessons to help you have practical conversations in the real world. Check out how I've been using it. This is what if und folgendes passiert, wenn ich anfangen werde, Deutsch zu lernen. Have you ever wanted to learn a new language? Well, with Babbel, you can speak with confidence and have real-world conversations. It's got expert-crafted lessons, games, live classes, even podcasts. It's already helped me reach my 2024 goal of learning more and exploring a new language, so why don't you give Babbel a shot and get 60% off your subscription? Link in the description below. If you're a longtime fan of What If, you've probably heard this before, but Earth is a very special place. And even if a planet is deemed to be habitable, it doesn't mean that it resembles Earth very much. A habitable planet is a rocky planet located in the habitable zone, allowing water to stay on the planet's surface in its liquid form. That's it. Venus and Mars are habitable planets, but they are definitely not like Earth. So let's talk about three major conditions that we'd look for when searching for an even better version of Earth. First, it would need to have sunlight. Our sun's lifespan is about 10 billion years, and it took 4 billion years for anything more complex than the simplest life form to pop up on our planet. But K-type dwarf stars have lifespans of about 70 billion years, so if we found an exoplanet orbiting a K-type star, there would be more time for life to evolve and live on it. The second major condition is temperature. A planet that's too hot or too cold wouldn't be able to host the life forms we'd need to survive. But if we find a planet that's a mere 5 degrees warmer than Earth, and it has more water, we could be looking at Earth 2.0, covered in a lush, biodiverse rainforest. The third major condition we'd be looking for is size. Gravity retains a planet's atmosphere, and there's a direct relationship between gravity and a planet's size. So, if we find a planet that's only one and a half times larger than Earth, it would be able to hold on to its interior heat and maintain its atmosphere for a longer time. But bigger isn't always better. 
While Earth-sized exoplanets are usually rocky, about 50% of the exoplanets larger than Earth are gas giants. And if an exoplanet is too small, it would likely be barren, like Mars. So, are there any exoplanets out there that meet these requirements? Okay, I found a planet that could be super habitable. Kepler-1649c could be a contender to become Earth 2.0. It's 300 light-years away and orbits a red dwarf star. It gets sunlight, but only 75% as much as Earth, so it might be a bit cooler there. And there wouldn't be any seasons on Kepler-1649c. A full orbit only takes 19 and a half Earth days, so we'd need to get used to that. Oh, and it could be tidally locked, which means one side of the planet constantly faces its sun, while the other side faces space. Also, living on a planet that orbits a red dwarf star could be risky. Sometimes red dwarf stars send out massive flares, dousing an orbiting planet in UV light and creating huge temperature fluctuations. But if we decide that Kepler-1649c is worthy of becoming Earth 2.0, what would happen next? Well, using our current technology, it would take at least 2,000 years to reach this Earth 2.0. And since this planet is so far away, we only know about its size, the distance to its star, and the makeup of its atmosphere. So, we could pack up humanity, take the multi-generational trip to Earth 2.0, and discover that it's more like a Neptune 2.0. Uh, yeah, there's no way we could survive on a gas giant. We'd need much more information before we send humans to any possible Earth 2.0s. So, right now, NASA is developing a tiny probe to travel at one-fifth of the speed of light it could greatly expand our knowledge of exoplanets. And we shouldn't limit ourselves to looking just at exoplanets. A moon receives direct solar energy from its star, and the planet it orbits reflects solar energy toward it. So maybe a moon could be more suitable for human life than an exoplanet. The most Earth-like planet in our solar system is Titan, Saturn's largest moon. So, if we want to save thousands of years of traveling, maybe Titan could make a good second home for us. Six hundred and thirty-five light years from where you are sitting, way out there in outer space, lies a planet. The first planet to be discovered within the habitable zone of a sun-like star. Its name is Kepler-22b. When a planet is located within a star's habitable zone, it means there's a chance that liquid water exists on its surface. And where there's water, there's also the possibility of life. Human life. How long would it take to get to Kepler-22b? What would the weather be like over there? And why would you need to get jacked before arriving on this new planet? This is What If, and here's what would happen if you live on Kepler-22b. Kepler-22b is what scientists call an exoplanet. It's a planet outside our solar system. Spotting an exoplanet like Kepler-22b is often not easy. The bright glare of the stars they orbit tends to keep them hidden from our telescopes. What did scientists come up with to get around it? Looking at the stars themselves to see if they can find anything unusual about them. They spotted Kepler-22b using what's called the transit method. They watched Kepler-22, the star this exoplanet orbits around, and noticed that its brightness changes over time. That was because Kepler-22b was blocking the star's light. 
With this, scientists were able to learn both the size of 22b and how it orbits. And it looks like this distant space rock could become our next home. Okay, but what do we really know about Kepler 22b? Its mass is 36 times that of Earth, with a radius of two and a half times larger than ours. One year on Kepler 22b is 290 days. It's also located 15% closer to its star than we are to the Sun. If Earth scooched over that close to our star, you'd be fried. Kepler 22b, on the other hand, is lucky to have a sun that is remarkably similar to ours, but also smaller and cooler. This close proximity to its star allows the planet to receive about the same amount of sunlight as we get over here. The temperature on Kepler 22b could be about 15 to 22 degrees Celsius, similar to Earth's spring weather and quite habitable if you ask me. But our galaxy can be a cruel place, and not everything is good news. Some models suggest Kepler 22b is rotating on its side, kind of like our very own Uranus. This may sound insignificant, but it adds potentially deadly complications. This would mean that its north and south poles are shrouded in either darkness or sunlight for half a year. And this ain't simply a matter of whether you're a daytime or a nighttime person. A world like Kepler 22b spinning on its side means that temperatures could change from boiling to freezing, which wouldn't be great for human life. I know, what a bummer, but don't despair yet because our galaxy is also big enough to include some hope. New studies suggest that Kepler 22b might be covered in an ocean 50 meters deep. And that ocean would be able to act as natural climate control, keeping the wild temperatures at bay. You see, an ocean can store heat in the summer and release it during the winter, which results in a mild climate. Like you needed another reason to live close to the water. But hold on. How would you even make it all the way to Kepler 22b? I mean, even if you were traveling at the speed of light, it would take you 635 years. Your best bet could be to hibernate through the trip inside a device that preserves your body way past its natural lifespan, like cryogenic sleep. NASA has already developed a cryosleep chamber that can lower an astronaut's body temperature to as low as 32 degrees Celsius. This would trigger natural hibernation, during which catheters would provide your body with nutrients and remove any waste. But even in cryosleep, it would be quite the long, risky trip. This leads us to the most dangerous part about this journey. All that remains unknown about Kepler 22b. For starters, we still don't really know what gravity is like there. It could be twice as strong as our planets. If that was the case, a 10 kilogram sack of potatoes would now weigh 20 kilograms. And your body would also factor into the mix. Is your current weight 75 kilograms? Well, good luck suddenly dealing with 150 kilograms of you. And just for safety, settlers such as yourself would need to bulk up. Really bulk up. Only through intense strength training would you increase your chances of being able to walk on Kepler 22b. And once you got jacked on Earth? you'd have to figure out ways to preserve that muscle through all 635 years of light speed travel. But humans aren't the only life form that would be affected by a stronger gravity. Plants brought from Earth for oxygen and nutrition might not survive on Kepler 22b when you try growing them there. And if you brought any animals with you, they'd need to step up the evolution process. Higher gravity could lead to creatures developing additional legs to move around. 
It could also determine the location and size of internal organs. But the mysteries don't end there. Scientists still don't know for sure that Kepler-22b is even a rocky planet. It might be gaseous, similar to Neptune, or it could be entirely covered with water. If you and the other first settlers woke up from your cryo sleep and found yourself on a gas planet, yeah, that would be a downer. You wouldn't have a solid surface to even land your ship. Not to mention a place to set up camp. In that case, you and your crew would need to figure out how to build a cloud city orbiting the planet. If you landed on an ocean planet, a submarine town would be in order. Discovering Kepler-22b is a rocky planet would be hitting the jackpot then, right? Well, not so fast. Venus is also made of rock, and yet its dense atmosphere, consisting of greenhouse gases, makes it uninhabitable, with scorching temperatures far too hot for liquid water. If this was also the situation with Kepler-22b, our only chance at thriving on this exoplanet would be to employ robots that could build underground shelters. The place where maybe, just maybe, the temperature might be cool enough for you to bear. It just goes to show you that a prime location is no guarantee for human survival. And as exciting as it might seem to find other worlds to inhabit, our own Earth remains the perfect habitat for humanity. But this blue marble-like planet looks just like Earth, but only five seconds on this hostile death orb would kill you. Welcome to HD 189733b. This planet is enormous, even larger than Jupiter. And to keep comparing it to the largest planet in our solar system, it's also entirely made of gas. That's why scientists classify HD 189733b as a hot Jupiter. This planet is located so close to its star that it completes its orbit in just over two days. Yeah, HD 189733b is 13 times closer to its sun than Mercury is to our sun. And even though its star is cooler than ours, this fake Earth is still way outside its star system's habitable zone. That means no liquid water can exist on a planet's surface. Just how this giant gaseous planet developed so close to a star is still a mystery. One theory is that HD 189733b formed right next to it during the star's earliest moments. Or it could have developed further away, only to be pulled in as the rest of the planetary system formed. But there's one thing we know for sure. A visit to HD 189733b would be a plunge into hell with no chance of escape. Now, even if you knew there wasn't a single drop of liquid water on this planet, you'd have a hard time believing it as you approached the giant blue marble. With an average daytime temperature of nearly 1100 degrees Celsius, this planet is twice as hot as Venus, and Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system. One of the reasons for this intense heat is that the planet is tidally locked to its star, just like our own moon is to Earth. That means HD 189733b takes as much time to spin on its axis as it does to revolve around the star. So one side of the planet is constantly in daylight, while the other side is shrouded in darkness. The inviting look of this world doesn't come from its oceans like it does here on Earth. No, this hellish planet gets its color from clouds of molten silicate particles. These particles scatter more blue light than red, making the planet appear blue. Silica is the primary ingredient in glass, and you should bring a heavy-duty umbrella because you'd need to take cover from what would essentially be hot, molten glass rainstorms. But that's not the only danger. 
you'd need to be ready to brace yourself against the extremely powerful winds that you'd find sweeping across the planet. With speeds up to 7,000 kilometers per hour, these gusts are almost 30 times stronger than even the most powerful Category 5 hurricanes on Earth. Compared to the strongest winds on other planets in our solar system, HD's winds are almost four times stronger than those on Neptune. But hey, they might smell a little better than the ice giant's hydrogen sulfide clouds. Those carry a whiff of rotten eggs. Blech. HD's winds are so fast that they'd whip past you at about six times faster than the speed of sound. They would be extremely loud, but I think you'd be more worried about them tearing your body apart. You might be long gone by now, killed by that molten glass rain. In any case, you wouldn't last too long on HD 189733B. I really don't recommend traveling there. But there are some planets out there that can kill you even faster. Check out OGLE TR56B. This gas giant sits in a galaxy nearly 100 light years away from Earth. It's even larger than HD. Its mass is nearly 1.4 times as much as Jupiter's, and somehow it's even closer to its star, too. You'd find this world to be incredibly scorching hot. Surface temperatures on this planet average around 1700 degrees Celsius. That's so hot that it turns metal to gas, creating iron clouds in the upper atmosphere. If you got caught in the rain here, you'd find it to be an extremely unpleasant and deadly shower of hot molten iron. Your skin would burn right off, and so would your insides. But things could get even hotter. Some 670 light years away from Earth, there's a planet so hellish that it's tearing molecules apart. Meet Kelt 9b. This gas giant is almost three times more massive than Jupiter. It takes Kelt only one and a half Earth days to speed through the orbit around its sun. And just like HD 189733b, it's tidally locked with one side always facing the hot star. Landing on this planet, you'd experience temperatures as high as 4,300 degrees Celsius. It's the most scorching exoplanet we've ever discovered. Scientists call this gas giant an ultra-hot Jupiter. And those high temperatures also make Kelt 9b hotter than most stars in the universe. So hot that it would destroy you. Come on. This world rips apart molecular hydrogen gas. What do you think it would do to your body? But before you even arrive on this hot planet, you'd be exposed to deadly amounts of radiation coming from its host sun. Yeah, Kelt 9b receives about 44,000 times more energy from its star than Earth does from the sun. This radiation would cook you alive instantly. Okay. If you somehow managed to survive all the lethal radiation of Kelt's star and the unimaginable heat of the planet, well, you'd still have to take on its incredibly strong winds. Scientists think those winds could reach speeds of 60 kilometers per second. Yeah, that's 30 times faster than the winds on the deceivingly Earth-looking planet HD 189733b. Okay, so if I get this straight, Kelt 9b would swirl you, burn you, and tear your molecules apart. Hmm, 1 out of 10. Would not recommend. Thousands of light years from Earth, there could be another planet hospitable to life. Kepler 69c. And you're about to travel to this alien world to see that life with your own eyes. What would it be like to make this epic journey so far across the universe? What kind of planet would you be likely to find upon arrival? And if you did discover life, what would it look like? This is What If 
And here's what would happen if there's life on Kepler-69c. Located 2,383 light years from Earth in the Cygnus constellation is a potential super-Earth. At least that's what it's often referred to as. Kepler-69c is an exoplanet about 1.7 times larger than our planet. And it could also be around three and a half times more massive. But there's a catch. We don't really know if this planet is located within the habitable zone of its star. If it's too close, Kepler-69c would be too hot for liquid water to exist on its surface. If it's too far from its sun, well, then it would be nothing more than a frigid world. What we do know is that Kepler-69c orbits its star about 40% closer than Earth orbits the sun. And that could mean that it isn't actually a super-Earth. It could be a super-Venus. So, if you traveled all the way here, would you find life? Or a thick, scorching atmosphere boiling every drop of water on the planet? Before you begin your journey to Kepler-69c, there'd be one very important thing to keep in mind. It's far away. Almost 600 times further away than Proxima Centauri, our closest neighboring star. Even if you could travel, say, 1% of the speed of light, you wouldn't get there anytime soon. At this speed, you could whip around Earth in just over 13 seconds, but to get to Kepler-69c? Well, that would take you about 238,000 years. To even make this trip possible, you'd need a super-advanced hibernation pod. You know, you don't want to grow too old and die before you could even get to your destination. Am I right? Well, hibernation technology that could help you sleep for over 200,000 years doesn't exist yet, but hey, this is what if. Anything's possible. By the time your ship makes its arrival, any life that may exist on Kepler-69c today could evolve or advance into something entirely different. Think about it this way. 300,000 years ago, humans were just beginning to create stone tools and spears. And look at you now, making a trip across the galaxy. Looking back at the planet you left behind, who knows what changes would happen to our human civilization during your trip. No matter what, it's way too late to turn around now. Based on the planet's distance from its star, we know that Kepler-69c receives a similar amount of sunlight as Venus. And despite being more massive than Earth, it has a relatively low density. All this means is that instead of metals, this rocky planet is made of silicate and carbonate minerals. That could make things a little complicated. You see, with all these minerals in the crust, Kepler-69c could have a really thick atmosphere. And to make matters worse, this atmosphere would be composed mostly of carbon dioxide. Uh-oh, did you choose the wrong super-Earth to travel to? Yeah, if Kepler-69c is anything like Venus, it would be a pretty hot planet. All because, similar to Venus, its clouds would trap the heat and create an extreme greenhouse effect. Kepler-69c's atmosphere would be caught in an endless cycle of getting thicker and hotter. But nobody said this world should be habitable for you. Oh no, once you took off your helmet, you'd instantly melt and suffocate. Like I said, life on this planet would be completely different from what you'd imagine. As you made your approach, you'd find surface temperatures as high as 475 degrees Celsius, and the atmospheric pressure would be over 90 times that of Earth at sea level. It would be like being 900 meters deep in the ocean, except you'd be on dry land. 
with conditions like this, you'd likely not find anything resembling an ocean here. Just like on Venus, the high temperatures would boil away all the water. Whatever life you could potentially encounter on this planet, it would need to be able to survive in these brutal conditions. Or it would have to exist somewhere else besides the surface. One place you could discover life on Kepler-69c would be up in the clouds. Around 50 kilometers up, temperatures would be much, much cooler. They would range from about 30 to 70 degrees Celsius. And with its low density, this planet could have a surface gravity that would be just over 70% of what's found on Earth. This weaker gravity could allow life forms to thrive in the sky, where Kepler-69c is most hospitable. Life could just be floating freely in the atmosphere. This would be another way in which this planet could have far more in common with Venus than with Earth. Probes around Venus have picked up traces of a gas that could be a potential sign of life, phosphine. If you discovered phosphine in Kepler-69c's atmosphere, it could be the result of bacteria that don't require oxygen to survive. But be ready to hold your nose. This smelly gas has an odor similar to decaying fish. On Earth, the bacteria that produce phosphine often live in swamps or wetlands, but on Venus or Kepler-69c, this bacteria could exist in the thick, oxygenless atmosphere itself. So, in the end, you may have traveled a very, very long way to find the smallest and stinkiest of life forms. Now, on the upside, you've just discovered extraterrestrial life. Now this is a planetary emergency evacuation. Please remain calm and board your space shuttles. You know, even though humanity might not have to leave the Earth in your lifetime, we should start preparing early on. Not only could it take centuries to set up the relocation program, it would take generations to move to a potential new home. That right there is Proxima Centauri B, or just Proxima B. It's the closest potentially habitable planet out there. Its temperatures are in the bearable range and it could have just the right breathable atmosphere. We only have to get there. How long would our journey last? How many people would we send to populate the new world successfully? And what if it turned out that Proxima B wasn't as habitable as we thought? This is what if, and here's what would happen if we relocated humanity to Proxima B. When astronomers started finding planets outside our solar system, or exoplanets, we realized that there are many worlds out there. That meant that Earth doesn't have to be our home forever, and that we don't have to die with our planet when the sun engulfs it some five billion years from now. Now that we've found over 4,100 exoplanets, we've learned something rather disappointing. Not all exoplanets are good for humans to live on. Most of the worlds we've encountered are either ice giants like Neptune or gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn. Only 161 of those planets are terrestrial, like Earth. And when it comes to sustaining human life, being terrestrial isn't quite enough. Proxima b is very promising. It orbits a red dwarf star called Proxima Centauri in a system with three stars in it. Proxima Centauri is small. It only has between 7.5 and 50% of our sun's mass. That's a good thing. Because the red dwarf Proxima Centauri is so much smaller than our yellow dwarf sun, it burns at a lower temperature. 
it takes stars like Proxima Centauri much longer to burn through all of their hydrogen supply. Because of that, Proxima Centauri has a lifetime of trillions of years, while our Sun has a 10 billion year exploration term. That alone makes Proxima b a good candidate for relocation. That, and the fact that its orbit lies in Proxima Centauri's habitable zone, that means there's the potential for liquid water and comfortable surface temperatures. If we're lucky, Proxima b would have an atmosphere that we could breathe. If it does, the surface temperatures would be in the range of 30 degrees. I don't know about you, but I'd move there right now. I just need to warn you that there are a few problems. A trip to Proxima b would be long and very dangerous. Proxima b might be the closest habitable exoplanet we've got, but that doesn't mean it's close. The red dwarf star Proxima Centauri is about 4.3 light years away. That means that if you could travel at the speed of light, it would take you 4.3 years to get there. Nothing we've built so far can reach that kind of speed. Realistically, a trip to Proxima Centauri in a space shuttle would take 165,000 years, give or take. That's right, some of the colonists would be born in transit. Some of them would never see the Earth. Some of them would never see Proxima b. They'd just live their lives aboard the spaceship and die in space. How many humans would we need to send on a mission exactly? Well, according to some calculations, 98 people would be just enough. Their descendants would arrive at Proxima b with enough genetic diversity to populate the entire planet. And that's accounting for possible cases of infertility, inbreeding and sudden deaths. In those calculations, the crew would be traveling on something faster than a space shuttle. Their mission to Proxima b would only take 6,300 years. But don't be surprised, technology is constantly improving. Right now, a scientific and technological program called Breakthrough Initiatives is looking at how we can get in the neighborhood of Proxima Centauri within one generation. Their Project Starshot is working on an ultralight unmanned probe that would reach the star system in just 20 years. Now I definitely need to sign up. But again, Proxima b is really far away. It's so far that we can't even see if it has an atmosphere. It might just happen that we would arrive at a frozen planet with surface temperatures of minus 40 degrees. And even if it has an atmosphere, it might not be the right one. We might still enjoy warm temperatures, but we'd be doing that in spacesuits with oxygen tanks. Or Proxima b could be tidally locked to Proxima Centauri, meaning that one of the planet's sides would always face its star, and the other side would be plunged into darkness. Space flight itself could bring some unpleasant surprises. Spending an entire lifetime in a zero-gravity environment would lead the crew members to lose muscle and bone density. They'd be constantly exposed to space radiation. Their microbiomes, immune systems and physiology would all be different from ours. They wouldn't be the same kind of humans as we are. They would change their values and culture. They might forget all the farming techniques we'd teach them to sustain themselves in space and on their new planet. They might change their mind about the mission altogether and just turn their spaceship in a different direction. Who knows, they might even come back to Earth and take revenge for all those years they were forced to spend in space. If that happens, I'll be asking for a refund. Sending anyone on a mission like this is a huge risk. We'd need to design and build a vehicle, choose the space travelers very carefully, supply them with all the food and water, and make sure they could become self-sustaining. 
we'd have to design new propulsion, navigation, hibernation, and life support systems. And we have no way of knowing if Proxima B is actually habitable. Well, now I don't really feel like going there, do you? Avatar's Pandora is the wildest, most beautiful, and most deadly place in the galaxy. I mean, who wouldn't want to live here? But how could the air kill you? What elements could make your body glow? And how could a gas giant destroy Pandora's surface? This is What If, and here's what would happen if you lived on Pandora. Welcome to Pandora. Located in the Alpha Centauri star system, this world is shrouded in mystery and the cinematic rules created by James Cameron. For starters, Pandora isn't even a planet. It's a moon of a gas giant just like our Jupiter. If this deadly moon existed in real life, it would have to follow the laws of physics. And that's good news for you because on Pandora, you'd weigh 20% less than you do on Earth. Take advantage of that weaker gravity and leap across the untamed alien jungle. But under no circumstances should you ever jump in this water. The gas giant Pandora revolves around is called Polyphemus. This massive planet is only a bit smaller than Jupiter, but it's big enough to destroy all life on the world you just arrived on. Pandora and Polyphemus are tidally locked, so only one side of this moon is always facing its gas giant. And that's dangerous, because it could cause tidal heating when one side gets a slightly larger gravitational pull than the other. Sure, this could create floating mountains along the magnetic waves of Polyphemus, except Pandora's surface wouldn't be anything like it is in the movie. In reality, it would look more like Jupiter's moon Io, which also happens to be the most volcanically active world in the solar system. And if that wasn't enough, Pandora's sky would be radioactive. Well, sort of. If the magnetosphere of Polyphemus was just as big as Jupiter's, Pandora would be trapped within it. There, it would be bombarded with charged particles from its own star system. If Pandora didn't have its magnetosphere, you'd have no buffer from these intense rays, so you'd better wear a what-if-approved protection suit. And trust us, you would want to have this suit, because even if it wasn't radioactive, the atmosphere would still kill you. On Pandora, the air would be mostly made up of carbon dioxide and xenon. Both of these gases in high concentration would instantly suffocate you. Oh, and that rotten smell? Yeah, that's hydrogen sulfide. It won't kill you, but <laughs> you'll wish you were dead. You might have to live underground or maybe even underwater. In Avatar, The Way of the Water, You'll dive under the waters of Pandora, but if this planet existed, the water could kill you. That's because that water would likely be highly acidic, thanks to the high carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. It could be so bad, it would dissolve all sea life that has shells. Yeah, and that would severely affect the food chain. Even worse, one dip in these waters could burn your skin off. You'd need to make sure that protection suit was waterproof. But if you set up your life in the ocean, well, you'd miss the beauty above the surface. Since Pandora and its gas giant are tidally locked, Polyphemus would always be visible in the sky. You would watch Alpha Centauri A rise and set just as our sun does, but Polyphemus would never leave your sight if you were on Pandora's right side. The other side of the moon would never get this magnificent view. This comes with some trade-offs. 
like you'd have a hard time falling asleep. The Alpha Centauri star system Pandora is located in has not just one, not two, but three suns. Pandora would orbit around Alpha Centauri A, but another star, Alpha Centauri B, would also be sending a lot of light Pandora's way. It burns 2,300 times as bright as the full moon on Earth. And you wouldn't even be able to watch Netflix during your sleepless nights. Standard electronics wouldn't last long in this environment, not with all that radiation and electrical interference. You'd need space marine-grade technology to survive in this world. At least there would be enough animals and plants for you to feast on. Only, I'd recommend running chemical tests for heavy metals and strong acids before you eat anything. Undetected toxins could destroy your kidneys and liver. And there might be an unexpected side effect. If you ate too much glowing food, you might become bioluminescent. Pandora would be a world of incredible species and extreme wildlife. Hey, soon enough, you might be taming an Ekron for the commute around your strange and lethal home. One hundred and twenty light years away from us, there's an exoplanet that can potentially host life. It's called K218b, and it's a world you'd want to visit. K218b isn't exactly like Earth, it's more like a super Earth. Yeah, it's 2.6 times larger and almost 9 times more massive than our planet. Scientists think it could be a Haitian exoplanet which is just a fancy way of saying that it likely has a hydrogen-rich atmosphere and is covered in liquid ocean. That means that K218b could be home to alien life. Only it would take a really long time to get there. If you were hurtling toward this space rock from Earth, you'd reach your destination in about 1.3 million years. Yeah, you heard right. Million. K218b has a lot of methane and carbon dioxide in its atmosphere. That's not exactly breathable air, so you'd still need a spacesuit to walk on this world. And I wouldn't be too hyped up about its ocean, either. If an exoplanet has liquid on it, it doesn't mean that the liquid is water. It could be methane or ammonia, even acid. Like, even in our own solar system, there's a moon covered in liquid lakes, but these are methane and ethane lakes, and I uh, wouldn't recommend swimming there. K218b could have a pretty mild temperature, for an exoplanet that is. At minus 100 degrees Celsius, you'd find this world incredibly cold. Now, the most exciting thing we've found out about this world is that it could have traces of dimethyl sulfide. Woot woot! Well, on Earth, this molecule can only be produced by living things, and that means K218b could be home to alien life. Now, it doesn't mean that this life would be intelligent. It could be aquatic or microbial. Maybe even complex life, if the conditions for it are just right. We won't know for sure unless we travel to explore this interstellar world. Now, how do we know all this? Well, we had the James Webb Space Telescope look at this distant world and take detailed measurements of its atmosphere. Most of the exoplanets have been discovered using what's called the transit method. It's when a planet passes in front of its star and blocks its starlight. That's when scientists study the wavelengths around the planets, and some of those wavelengths can tell us what kind of atmosphere those distant planets have. The problem is, exoplanets are really far away. Trying to figure out what their surfaces are like just by peering through even our most powerful telescopes is not easy. Some scientists will argue that K218b isn't a super-Earth at all, but a mini-Neptune. 
And that's a bummer, because, as you know, Neptune is an ice giant. And if K2-18b is also an ice giant, then the chances for alien life on this planet don't look so good. Now, you don't have a million years to travel to this world to discover it for yourself, so maybe we should look at a world that's a lot closer to Earth. Like Proxima Centauri B. Proxima Centauri is the closest star we've discovered, only 4.2 light years away from Earth. It's part of the Alpha Centauri star system, with not two, but three stars orbiting each other. The exoplanet Proxima Centauri b orbits only one of these stars, but you'll still see the other two stars as bright dots in the sky. This exoplanet is slightly larger than Earth and revolves uncomfortably close to its host star. Luckily, that star is a red dwarf, and that's much cooler and smaller than our sun. Which is good news, because that means this planet isn't getting toasted like Mercury. Scientists estimate Proxima Centauri b has an average temperature of about minus 39 degrees Celsius. That's pretty comfortable as far as alien worlds go. The bad news is that we still don't know much about the exoplanet's gravity or atmosphere. It might be our best candidate to set up an interstellar base, but it also could have a harsh environment unsuitable for humanity's future home. It might even have an ocean of acid or something deadly like that. The only way to find out is to travel there. And if Proxima Centauri b doesn't work out, well, don't worry, there are plenty of potentially habitable worlds out there. Like this one. Ross 128b is 11 light years from Earth. It's the second closest potentially habitable world scientists have discovered. And it's more promising than Proxima Centauri b. The thing is, they both orbit red dwarf stars. Only Proxima b's host star is a lot more active and violent. It occasionally erupts and bathes Proxima b in radiation. Ross 128b's star is nice and quiet. And even though this world orbits 20 times closer to its star than Earth is to the Sun, it still lies in the habitable zone. Because like I said, red dwarfs are way cooler than the sun. And by cooler, I just mean temperature. This world could have a balmy average temperature of 23 degrees Celsius. That's only slightly hotter than the average temperature here on Earth. I don't know about you, but I could settle there. Now, we don't know enough about this world to call it our new home. It likely has lots of harmful radiation reaching its surface, and its atmosphere might not be breathable. But hey, that's not much worse than Mars. With efficient life support systems in place, we could make it work. Besides, this super-Earth might have its own life on it. If Ross 128b did have alien life, it could be extremely different from what you might imagine. Just think about making the first contact with an alien species. What would that be like? I mean, it could go very wrong, too. For one, we might not survive the trip to any exoplanets, even the nearest ones. So far, we've discovered and confirmed over 5,000 alien worlds. 63 of them are potentially habitable, but we just can't know for sure. There are hundreds of billions of alien worlds in the Milky Way galaxy. And scientists have already discovered and confirmed over 5,000 of them. They call these worlds exoplanets. Some of them are really small, like Kepler 37b. This tiny planet is even smaller than Mercury, the smallest planet in our solar system. Kepler 37 is just slightly larger than our own moon it could easily replace our cosmic companion in the night sky. Only it's pretty far from us. This tiny space rock is located 208 light years from Earth, where it orbits a star that's a bit smaller and cooler than our sun. Small rocky worlds like Kepler 37b are a pretty rare find. 
Because they're so tiny, they're more difficult to spot, but scientists have still managed to confirm about 200 of these worlds. Most of them are many, many times closer to their stars than our planet is to the Sun, and Kepler-62c is no exception. This Mars-sized exoplanet orbits its star roughly four times closer than Mercury orbits our Sun. It only takes a little over 12 Earth days to make a full orbit. Kepler-62c must be scorching hot and extremely volcanic. Eh, definitely not the kind of place you'd want to visit. And neither is this exoplanet, KOI 55b. Scientists think this planet used to be the size of Jupiter, but then its sun exploded into a red giant and swallowed the planet whole. Uh, no surprise there, KOI 55b is incredibly close to its star. So close that it takes this hellish world less than five hours to make one orbit. And KOI 55b is evaporating so much that it will soon disappear from its planetary system. It's not alone. Many of these planets have their atmospheres torn away by their host stars. Some 41 light years from Earth, there's a super Earth that used to be a mini Neptune. GJ 1132b might have had a thick hydrogen atmosphere in the past, but its young hot star stripped it away leaving only a rocky core behind. When its star stripped away its original atmosphere, some of the gases were absorbed into the planet's mantle, and now, through this planet's volcanism, they're released back. GJ 1132b could have become a potentially habitable world, but it's 26 times closer to its star than Mercury is to the Sun. No chances for life on this super-Earth. But life might be possible on these slightly larger super-Earths. Scientists have found many of these worlds orbiting in their sun-like stars' habitable zones. And that's good news. Now, we'd have to go and explore more of these planets up close to find out what their atmospheres are like. This one seems intriguing. Kepler-452b is 1.6 times the size of Earth, and it's about six billion years old. Earth is a youngster compared to this world. Our planet is only four and a half billion years old. Okay, now I know this is your favorite exoplanet, Kepler-22b, and I like it too. This super Earth might be covered in a super ocean. It sits comfortably in its star's habitable zone and has a huge potential for life. The only problem is that it's big. Kepler-22b is 2.4 times larger than Earth and about nine times more massive. If Kepler-22b was the size of Earth, it would have an average surface temperature of about 16 degrees Celsius. But because it's a lot bigger than Earth, it could be a rocky planet, a water world, or even a gaseous planet like Neptune. And speaking of gaseous planets, at this size, exoplanets stop being super-Earths and become gas giants. More than half of all exoplanets we've discovered are either Neptune-like ice giants or gas giants like Jupiter. Many of them orbit a little too close to their host stars, and they pay a high price for that proximity. For one, they're incredibly hot, and sometimes their host star rips their atmosphere away. Eh, kind of like what GJ 1132b went through. But among them, there are some cold planets too. Oof! This is Kepler 16b. It's not quite as large as Jupiter, but the cool thing about it is that it orbits not one, but two stars. Only you wouldn't be able to see those stars because you wouldn't be able to stand on its surface. You see, Kepler 16b is a Saturn sized gas giant. It might have some rocky elements inside it, but its two host stars are much cooler than our sun, making Kepler-16b a frigid, lifeless world. Okay, now on to the worlds that are bigger than Jupiter. This delicious exoplanet has the density of a marshmallow. 
TOI 3757b is slightly larger than Jupiter, but it's not nearly as massive. But there are always bigger and badder planets out there, like Kepler-7b. This one is interesting. Kepler-7b is larger than Jupiter, but it has half of Jupiter's mass. This means the planet is like a super light cloud, a scorching hot super light cloud. Kepler-7b is a hot Jupiter planet. It's 12 times hotter than the king of the solar system. Still, Kepler-7b is not the hottest or the weirdest of the exoplanets. Some of these gas giants are so unimaginably hot that they tear molecules apart. Yeah, and some planets are just doomed. 1400 light years away from Earth, a star slightly bigger and hotter than our Sun is devouring its planet. This planet is called WASP-12b. It's almost double the size of Jupiter, but it's not going to last very long as far as planetary lives go. WASP-12b is so close to its star that it takes just over one Earth day to complete its orbit. Its own star is actually eating the planet's atmosphere, making it stretch into the shape of this egg. Ten million years from now, WASP-12b will be gone. And some exoplanets are unimaginably huge. The biggest one of them is almost seven times larger than Jupiter. HD 100546b isn't just seven times larger than Jupiter, it's also 750 times more massive. HD orbits its star 10 times further away than Jupiter orbits the Sun. That's pretty far, and it makes scientists wonder how this gigantic exoplanet formed so far away from its star. There's no doubt that some exoplanets out there look promising for finding life. We've found quite a lot of them orbiting in the habitable zone of their stars. In fact, some of these worlds might even be better for life than Earth. But that's a story for another What If. there be an even better planet for us than Earth? Scientists are searching for a super habitable world that wouldn't just rival Earth, but be a place where life could thrive even more easily. And they're looking at 